hi everyone uh good afternoon good evening according to the time zone you're in uh, I would like to welcome you to our uh, webinar, which is an online fireside chat, uh, and it's going to be about uh, cybersecurity and leading railway companies. I'm honored to be joined by uh, three amazing speakers here coming from uh, railway companies from around the world. Uh, all of them are experienced in um, cybersecurity and of course railway operational systems and i'm sure their perspectives will be very interesting for everyone to hear and it's one of those unique opportunities that you get get to learn from uh people who are actually operating uh the busiest uh and the most advanced uh Around about the session. So the session is a serious obsession that uh, is one of uh, the serious obsessions that we organize here at Silos. Uh, my name is Mick Schiffman and I'm the CTO of Silos. Uh, Silos is a company uh, which is focusing on railway cybersecurity. Uh, we work to protect railway systems around the world. Uh, and we took uh, the mission of promoting this topic of railway cybersecurity uh, and uh, um, I'm very thankful to the speakers here to join us to this session. Uh, and I see that uh, the audience is also uh, getting in uh, and contains railway experts from all around the world. It's going to be very interesting uh, to hear, learn from the speakers, and also you as an audience have an opportunity uh, to list your questions. Uh, uh, and we will give some time at the end of the session in which you could also like ask uh, the speakers questions and they will try to help from their experience. Uh, and uh, to help you with the topics that are on top of your mind. Um, by the way, please also like feel free to share your feedback after the webinar. It's going to be very interesting for us to learn more about uh, what topics are you interested in and so on, but also we might it in the end. Um, so this was a quick introduction. Uh, and the next I want to move to our speakers here, uh, Chan, Christian and Vish, uh, and ask them maybe to introduce themselves for the audience um before we go into the technical details and i'm sure everyone would be happy to hear about your backgrounds as well um so chen would you like to start sure uh could you hear me could you hear me yes, hello, hello. Hear you. yes okay i i'm coming from hong kong the the metro mtl in fact my background is uh, i was brought up as an engineer in electronic and gradually, I've expanded my uh, reach into the uh, cybersecurity a few years ago. Now I'm heading the cybersecurity for the operations in this railway. And uh, we are having quite a number of systems that we have to look after that may have uh, some cybersecurity concern. For example, we have a data network. Uh, within our uh, railway, and we also have a lot of system hooking up to the data network. And that's why we have to take particular care about that. Hope that I could elaborate more to, uh, in this webinar later. Thank you very much, Chan. Um, mm -hmm. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, good day. My name is Vesh, Vesh Kalsapura. I work for Network Rail. We are infrastructure managers in the United Kingdom. Uh, my background is I started off in defense, so and I've been associated with control systems. So for the past 20 odd years, uh, I have been um, working in the railway industry, both metro and mainline system. Uh, like I started off with ERTMS, funny enough, 20 years ago. Uh, and currently, like I carry the job title of principal engineer, but what that basically means is I look at introduction of new technologies uh, within our railway. Mm. Thank you very much, Vish. Uh, Christian, would you look at, would you like to go ahead? Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Christian Schlieber. I'm working for the German Railways, uh, so Deutsche Bahn. Uh, we are operating a large network of uh, infrastructure as well as uh, lots of trains uh, across Germany. And we also have some uh, logistics stuff uh, around the world. Um, my background is I originally started uh, studying informatics and afterwards uh, IT security, switched then over to uh, DBNet, so the infrastructure part of Deutsche Bahn, uh, where I 
was working on security solutions for uh, interlocking systems. Uh, later on, I was involved in the um, critical infrastructure initiatives that had been done regarding uh, the NIST directive and the German IT security law. Uh, and currently, I am working for the DB group uh, on this technical specification 5071 uh, on standard-like level. So standardization, how to how should we do uh, cybersecurity across uh, the European railways? That's great. Uh, thanks a lot for all of you for the introduction. Uh, I think it's super interesting to have you here, uh, both coming like all coming from uh, different countries. Um, I see a mixed background here of both metro and mainline systems, advanced signaling, also working in those initiatives that are trying to standardize uh, the topic of railway cybersecurity and how companies should manage it mm -hmm. uh, in a way that not every company will need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and like having some common initiatives and common practices, I'm sure it's something that will be very practical for the world. Uh, and we'll be happy to hear more about uh, these uh, during the session. Um, so the, the core reason that we're here is because of uh, the security or because uh, of, the, uh, of the topic of cybersecurity of uh, critical operational systems in railway companies. Uh, and at least from uh, my perspective, uh, working in this field, the situation has quite changed uh, in the past few years and I see it like always changing and every uh, new year I see new initiatives uh, and new approaches uh, and it would be very interesting for me to ask like all of you from your perspective uh, what has been changed uh, the way you see it uh, in the perception of cybersecurity and signaling, system, in signaling systems uh, also uh, on how signaling systems uh, has been changed or what is the impact of cybersecurity and signaling system if you compare it to five to ten years ago in which like signaling of course existed uh, but it was maybe a bit different or the approach was a bit different um, so maybe let's start from christian uh, what is your perspective about it uh let, let me state it like this uh when let's move a bit more back in time so around about 20 years People were developing signaling systems. They were developed according to a functional, to more functionality, to more performance, uh, better operation, and so on. So, at this time, you had electronic interlocking systems uh, invented around the world, uh, and everything was fine. Uh, I think around 10 years ago, like you mentioned, Mickey, then things started to change slowly. We had the first um, cyber attacks on industrial control systems. And people around the world uh, started thinking about, might this also affect our signaling systems, for instance? Um, so far, in this point of time, not that much happened at this point, but people were starting to think about security of such systems. I think five years ago, um, this is also when I started working for uh, the DB group, um, the situation was a bit like, OK, um, there is some legislation upcoming we have some issues and we should have a solution uh, to securing signaling systems but there was nothing really available on the market at this point of time you had some standards available but these were like iso 27001 you can do all or nothing uh, but nothing specific and people were a bit lost let's say it like this um, from then on till now, I think the situation is getting better. If you go and speak to uh, suppliers of systems and so on, most of them are aware of the situation. Most of them know about security and are also doing some stuff regarding security. The main challenge now is, does the things, do the things these people are doing fit into your company's strategy or not? So mm -hmm. it's more a bit of this way. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, in, in, very interesting points. Chen, would you like maybe to elaborate about it from your perspective? Uh, sure. Yeah, in fact, it, uh, it is very correct to say that some 20 years ago, cybersecurity, you may not find it, the definition from the from the dictionary, but uh, as times pass by, 
uh, actually it is getting it's becoming a, a hot topic in particular on the IT side that is uh, the, say for example our, our general use on the IT side um, my recollection that the first time that I heard about that uh, the cyber security is also a issue for the so-called control system is back some 10 years ago when there's a news talking about um, there is a, a so-called stubnet that actually is going to affect some of the control system. And it is also for the first time that we have to secure some sort of a patches right, from the OEM, the manufacturers, so that we could patch our system as a precaution. I think that is the first time that I heard about that. And then um, a couple of years ago, when we perhaps you heard about the so-called WannaCry crisis that is in uh, 2017, that actually that it is a global uh, uh, hacking, a, a, a ransomware, but it also starts to affect the railway as well. For example, actually in the Dutchess Bank, uh, some of the uh, train arrival information display are being hacked and I pop up with the window talking about uh, you need to pay uh, for it before you can actually get the release uh, by Bitcoin, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think this is another one. And in the last two years, we have heard a, bit, a little bit more about that. Most of them are talking with uh, 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 hiccups on the ticketing system, right? Maybe the Denmark, maybe the San Francisco, and and these are getting more popular, right? Uh, so far, I have not heard of a particular uh, a damage to the signaling system so far. But uh, I would say that uh, eventually, some sometime, someday, we have to face it. The reason being that uh, traditionally, our signaling system is quite a standalone system. Uh, we we rely on the hard wire, and sometimes uh, we call it a, a isolated system or a closed system. And uh, the, the applications are very dedicated. It's not one run on some of the uh, more popular uh, operation system like Windows. But as the time uh, goes by, I think we are now having more of this real system that uh, are computer-based, and they are actually using more standard uh, operating system like Windows, Linux, and, and such as like that. So the chance of having the, the possibility is getting a little bit higher because of the exposures of this uh, more common operating systems. And also that um, the system are now getting more interconnected. That, Therefore, we are we cannot say that our system is totally isolated uh, or uh, somebody used the word air gapped. So we have to face the fact that uh, one day someone is going to try to pick into our system. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chan. Yeah, it's, it's those are very interesting points because uh, we're talking about like whether someone uh, have infiltrated before or will infiltrate a signaling system. Uh, I think that's a very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, mostly, like one of the main like questions that uh, I, I I think a lot about um, in this topic is how would you even know if it happens? So that's like an interesting uh, interesting thought to have in mind. Um, yeah, I'll be happy also like at some point in this uh, discussion also to hear your feedback about it. Um, Vish, would you like to also to elaborate how do you see it? Yeah, I think bringing up the rear guard, I've uh, got very little to add. Uh, so I think Chan made a very interesting point about um, IT security, but things are no different in OT as well. I think like my take on it is the current security state, it needs to be improved. Uh, with the legacy system and because of the whole life cycle costs, people don't tend to touch it for 10, 20, 15, years and more often than not the attitude is if it is not broke why fix it uh, but that doesn't take the threat away so clearly we you know the awareness has increased within the industry but we still have got a long way to go the new introductions or the new signaling systems are capable of introducing you know security defenses because we are now aware of it but today's railway is not running on new systems like some of some of our railways run on systems which are 40 50 70 years old so so yes so i think we we really need to improve our security system and need to look at it proactively thank you very much thank you very much for your perspective 
Great. So um, my next question to all of you will be about uh, the priorities or how do you prioritize within the railway organization the cybersecurity risks? Uh, I think that's a very interesting topic. Uh, I, I see that many of our all, many of our attendees here are also uh, operating uh, are, are also operating uh, operational systems uh, within their railway companies. Uh, and, and I was actually getting asked a lot about it. Um, many companies asking like, what should I focus on? How do I prioritize the risks? Uh, and I, I will be happy to hear your take on that. Um, so Vish, would you like to start? Uh, yes, I think the, the first thing to do is to do a risk analysis because that's how you prioritize risk. Uh, more often than not, whenever we start off any project, be it let out a contract, uh, on the top of the file is financial risk, operational risk, so on and so forth. So traditionally, security risk has never figured within, within the contract procedures as such. Now, with the introduction of a CSM and NISTI, and, and thanks to the awareness, so I think from at the time when we let out the contract, if we detail it in as many words to say, you know, like thou shalt have conduct a security risk analysis, that would go a long way. And once it starts coming from the top, it is easy for the, the suppliers and, and the contractors because they now know they have to price for it. And mind you, with, with due regards to, you know, all the attendees, if it is not in the contract, we may not get it. So, so I think the first point is to start introducing it at, at the higher level, which is, which is the contract. And, and then obviously it gets executed. Great. Uh, yeah, the, the, those are great points. Um, Christian, would you like to add on that maybe on how do you prioritize your risks? Uh, I can support most of the points that Vish already mentioned. Uh, what we had as a uh, specific challenge was that when we started with uh, an ally with thinking about risk and so on, it was like, okay, we, we have a, a whole bunch of systems. If I remember mm -hmm. right, only for the infrastructure, we had around about 200 or 300 technologies um, spread over the whole country. I think it was like 200 um, technical uh, facilities and so on. And it was uh, quite a mess where, where you should start first. <laughs> so uh, what we did at this point was uh, think about what of which of these assets are really essential for our railway operation. And from there on, we prioritized uh, where to do risk assessments first. But after this, also, a risk assessment was the next step. And from there, you uh, identified, OK, what risks are really important, which will affect our, your operation, and what should you do to mitigate these? So this was the general approach. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so sounds here important like to focus also on the critical to operations and uh, railway operations. Um, Chen, can, can you maybe add your take on this one? Sure. In fact, if you ask anyone, is there a risk for cybersecurity to our signaling or control system, they will say yes. But if you ask them, how are you going to quantify it, it will be a very difficult question. They will say, sorry, I don't know. Right, because traditionally, the, the, the risk assessment that we uh, get used to is based on historical figures or historical event and also the the frequency of the happening. But cybersecurity, because of the very uh, short history and also because of the fast moving uh, uh, technologies, it is hard for us to define the, the, the history of it. And because of that, we are unable to actually tie with the other risk assessment model that we have uh, uh, around this industry. And, um, but we, we, we try to do so uh, just to high, have to predict the, the kind of uh, uh, risks that we are being exposed to. Say for example, and we have to say for example, if I have this uh, cybersecurity attack, will it affect my safety of the operations? 
or will it affect just my surface of the operations? Um, looking at in the history of the so far, all these uh, attack in the railway, uh, I could categorize it into two to three different uh, types. The first one is called the DDoS. Actually, it is a flooding of our uh, internet facing portal. Most of these are just for ticketing or for information. It would not actually hamper our control and our signaling system. The second type is uh, talking about the ticketing system. That is actually, uh, we are going to lose the revenue or lose the profit because we actually, we have the ticketing system going down. Uh, the last one is more on some sort of ransomware where actually, uh, they're asking for us to pay to recover the system. And so far, this ransomware are more on the uh, IT part of the control system, that is the, the display or, or some of the operation system. And uh, we do not have sufficient history about how it is going to affect our core, that is our signaling and the control system yet. And um, But in Hong Kong, we are trying to model it based on this, the, the earlier three uh, model as much as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot, that's a great point. Uh, by the way, I was asked to remind that uh, this session is actually recorded and will be available later as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And the second thing is that that's for the audience, please feel free to write down your questions uh, in your uh, Q&A tab uh, and uh, mm -hmm. we, 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 we will allocate time to address them in the end of the session. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for your answers. Uh, I think that these are interesting, uh, the topics of uh, uh, the topics you mentioned about how do you prioritize risks based on unknown information from the past and also like how do you prioritize risks in such big systems that have like all of those uh, parts and how do you choose the ones that affect the safety and how do you actually like learn about the risk then that's these are actually very interesting topics to discuss. The next one is also about, um, the next question is also a question that I get asked uh, a lot uh, in meetings, but also I see it as different in every company and it's great to have you here to hear your perspectives about it. And it's about, uh, let's say the required knowledge or the required qualification for someone to deal with cybersecurity risks for uh, operational systems. So it's a lot about how the, how the organization is built, uh, mm -hmm. how is it built to guard um, to, uh, let's say you have uh, your operational systems which are dealing with uh, the ongoing operations. Usually you have also uh, people who are more dealing with the future systems and so on. And, and you have people dealing with the IT and security. Uh, and my question is uh, first, like how, how is your organization built with regard to cybersecurity? How do you make sure that people have all the right competence uh, to deal with it and have all the right knowledge. And, and let's say that if you have uh, people uh, that are dealing with the topic from both the security perspectives, but also from the signaling perspective, how do they establish like, the right channels uh, to communicate and how decisions are being made in a way that uh, like everyone is taking, everything is taken into account, both like the cybersecurity risk and of course something which is not less important and is the impact to operation, the impact to safety safety analysis of all the situation. Um, so Chana, we'll be happy to start with you. Um, can you maybe elaborate on how is it an NPR or how is it from your experience? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, in fact, uh, trying to get a so-called qualification to handle the cybersecurity risk is in the control system in industry is not easy. Uh, so far, I think, uh, we have to adopt it from the IT side. Say for example, the IT side, they have some certified information security profession. This is a, a course with an examination that will give us some of the uh, more generic uh, knowledge about cybersecurity and the control and how you're going to handle it. And uh, there's also another tra training, uh, training you to be a hacker. Well, I think this is a good one because uh, that would allow you to have the foundation uh, to, to know how the general IT industry is evolving. But this is, these are not, uh, uh, how is it, tailored for the control system or the learning system. Uh, but there are now uh, one of the industrial standards called the IEC 62443 is more on the industrial commercial network, in particular on the system security. 
Uh, this one, uh, we are now getting more popular and as actually there are training courses offered by some professional body uh, to, to at least to train you up so that you understand how the standard uh, works and what are being sp spelled out in the standard. Um, in, in MTR, I think we are now going in this direction is trying to train up our own staff to do all, all these things uh, and gradually building up their competency uh, as they start. I, in the past, we are more relying on the external help, but we believe that the, the competency of our staff is also important because they have to handle the work uh, uh, day in, day in, day out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and, and regarding the communication channels, how do you like communicate between the signaling people and, uh, uh, and, and the IT security, except for qualification? Uh, do you also have like, uh, do, do you also have some dedicated channels for that in your organization and NPR? Oh yes, sure. And uh, in fact, our IT side and our, our control side, we work hand in hand. Uh, because actually uh, anything happening in the IT side will be a, a lesson learned for the OT side and the vice versa. So that's why we have some quite close connection between the IT and the OT side. Although we believe, uh, so we belong to two different organization hierarchy, but uh, actually we have a lot of uh, dialogue among us. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, that's very interesting. Uh, Vish, uh, would you like to elaborate maybe on how is it in network rail with mm -hmm. regard? Uh, yes, I think I will come from the OT side of things because I'm a control systems engineer. So like within network rail, we sort of realize that uh, the signaling specialists are not exactly the, the most brilliant cybersecurity specialists, uh, even though we would like to be thought as we are. Um, so we put a layered approach. Uh, the chief security officer is a professional head and um, that person is responsible for setting out the, the policies and compliance documents and that affects the whole of network rail services. Then we have the CISO um, who sits at both on the IT and for the OT aspects and they are sort of based in uh, telecommunication side of things is it's just that that's the department they are in but they cover the control systems as well and one of the things we've realized is there are so many projects going on so we have something called as a gate process so wherein before you go to the next step of any project you have to pass through a gate and this is where the representative of uh, the chief security officer and the CISO they they come in so they do get visibility at a very early stage. And this is how we maintain connectivity with the experts as such. And they in turn have got access to the experts who can do security analysis, risk analysis, and things like that. And, and that's how we rope in the entirety of uh, the security organization within a particular project. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, Christian, would you like also to maybe give a perspective of Deutsche Bahn on that? Uh, yes, sure. Um, in general, we have three types of departments. So normally in each of our business units, we have uh, one common uh, IT security department, which is also responsible for the IT systems and so on, and is uh, keeping track of all the governance things, operating the ISMS and things like these. Then uh, we have in the bigger units also a specific OT department. Uh, mm -hmm. There are guys uh, which have an IT security background or a uh, signaling system background, and um, they really interact with the systems and the people out there in the field and give them advice how to, for instance, implement controls and how to handle uh, vulnerabilities and so on. So these guys uh, usually have quite some knowledge about the systems out there and in case they have some issues regarding uh, security and so on they are free to ask the let's say governance organization uh, and for our whole group we have a uh, separate third department which um, has sort of the shared functions 
for instance, if you want to have a penetration test or something like this for your systems, you uh, can easily ask there if we currently have some penetration testers available, then they are uh, sent to the coding unit and do the stuff. Uh, and also some specific capacity building regarding OT is done in this unit. <laughs> um, as you are, were asking for qualifications, um, I think from my point of view, it's quite hard currently to find uh, real experts for uh, railways and security out there in the field. Uh, I think the market is quite empty. So uh, what we mm -hmm. usually do is we either hire an, a security guy or one guy who has some background in OT systems in general and then uh, do trainings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting actually to hear like three different perspectives here and like each one of you has its own uh, own direction of how things are being made. I know that I know that for sure like I was asked this question a lot uh, and also we, we also talk about it in our company in which we train people for doing both of those topics. So that's very, very valuable to hear. Mickey, Mickey. Yes. Uh, may I just supplement a little bit? I, I love the idea of training up our own staff. In fact, uh, I could supplement a little bit more is that, in fact, we could uh, go from two different directions. One is that we have a IT guy, right, mm -hmm. uh, with this uh, security uh, knowledge, and then we fit them with the OT knowledge so that he could marry the two together. Another direction is that actually we find a signaling and control guy and train them up for the IT park on the cyber security so that he would know more about how the, the IT part or, or the, the cybersecurity is going to affect uh, their control system. So I think this is a, a two-way approach. Uh, yeah. I think both are, are good, right? I, I actually like very like, I, I really like this approach of like training also the people internally. You mentioned here different types mm -hmm. of uh, standards like IC6 to four for free or other like hacking mm -hmm. courses and so on. I know that within our company, for example, uh, part of the onboarding process is to learn both the cybersecurity aspects, but many people are coming with this background already, uh, but also uh, learn about signaling by reading the standards, by mm -hmm. practicing some simulations and of operations of how like, and actually and understanding it from the top to the bottom. So from the operations part to the level of the bits and the bytes and try like to combine them together. So uh, the people will actually understand the constraints of operations but at the same time, we'll understand how things are implemented behind the scenes. So this is at least uh, like my take on that. That's something that we worked a lot on on the onboard, onboarding process, like how to get people into those topics and like try to get them into the basics and until like the more advanced parts. Uh, but yeah, it's very interesting. By the way, I've, I've, I think I've, uh, specifically for ETCS, I think I saw that someone opened like an online free course and uh, during the co corona, the, the, during the corona times of like, different chapters of the ETCS standards and how like how to build up on them. So uh, if you can be interested, I can, I can, I can maybe hear it after, after the webinar as well. But that's at least the way that you can take someone from the IT security background and teach them into railways. The other way around is probably like maybe doing some capture the flag challenges for hacking and reading some standards for others or doing trainings in IC6 to hacking. Um, so at least that's also like, I, I try to add my take on that one. Uh, Mm -hmm. um, great. Uh, the next question uh, will be addressed uh, to uh, Vish and Christian. I'll be happy to hear from you uh, about uh, some example from your experience of uh, real-world uh, cyber railway vulnerability or incident. Um, so uh, maybe Christian, would you like to start? Uh, yes. Um... I think one was already mentioned uh, during the introduction by uh, one of the colleagues. Uh, so I'll not focus on this. Um, let's take one other thing that uh, happened some years ago. Um, I think everybody remembers the meltdown inspector issue, uh, which affected almost all uh, processing units and so on. Uh, this was quite some issue also for uh, us as an railway operator because um, we buy stuff from vendors and they usually buy components from commercial off-the-shelf stuff. Things like uh, central processor units, they are 
not produced on their own, they simply buy it. So it was quite an issue when we had this uh, CVSS score of nine or whatever it was, so at least very high regarding those vulnerabilities. So everybody was alerted. And the first issue was that happened then was, okay, we have lots of components where we think that might be affected, um, but you normally don't have that much information about the internals of the components. So you have to ask all the vendors that you have. Uh, trigger them to uh, tell you if they use this, these components. Then you received answers like, hmm, maybe we have them in specific um, versions of the component, but we are not really sure. So they start investigating on their own. So it took quite some time. Um, afterwards, we identified, okay, there are some components out there, but what was also important um, besides the identification of what is really affected is that even if a uh, score for normal IT systems is quite high in this um, domain, for, for instance, 9.5 for uh, Meltdown Inspector, if you think about the operating environments and the context where your system usually is running, you have to um, check if this very really is applicable to your systems. And I think after reassessing the uh, value and checking if this is can be used really, the attack vector, we came up with something that was not that severe afterwards and mm -hmm. identified, okay, we should patch this within one of the later cycles. So mm -hmm. within a normal patch, because you usually don't have uh, internet browsers or uh, internet access on mm -hmm. signaling systems. Mm -hmm. The key, uh, what I wanted to tell is, even if there are some vulnerabilities that affect your system, uh, think about if they really are that bad to your OT systems than they are to standard IT stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, Vish, would you like to give your take on that? Yeah, I think I'll just pick up where uh, Christian left us and narrate an incident which happened a few uh, years ago, I think. Now, there are two people who know the system quite well. One is the designer, of course, and the second one, funny enough, is the maintainer. <laughs> now, in a railway system, and this is no disregards to the, the maintainers in the audience, if there are any, uh, but they do know the system very well, and as is human nature, is they will try and simplify the work which they are required to do on a system. So within the risk analysis, I would classify this particular incident as an accidental insider uh, event. So what happened in this particular case is a secure system or what we call as a self force system within the railway, uh, like an interlocking, was actually connected remotely for diagnostic purposes. No, it's not illegal, it's perfectly safe. It's just that nobody bothered to do a risk analysis on it because it was done as an afterthought. The reason being to get to the housing which um, which had the interlocking uh, maintainer had to cross the the live railway and you know they they just wanted to download some maintenance logs so they thought it's a good idea so you know like connecting a, a feed of that particular port um, was was not a big deal but then in this particular instance, uh, the maintainer actually did not up update the drawings because it was supposed to be a temporary arrangement. And that temporary arrangement was still in place till after six years. And well, that sort of became a norm. So what that did is it actually opened up and that particular remote connecting feed then got connected to the intranet. And behold, whilst not very many people were aware of it, but it opened up a window of opportunity that you know people could actually access it without having the right uh, security clearances. So this one was actually identified when they decided to update the wiring and they found one wiring which they didn't know why it was coming in the first place. And to be, to be fair, our colleagues in IT who are responsible for the upgrade actually duplicated it because they thought it's a good idea to have another duplicate connection. So behold, all of a sudden, a remote connection 
became duplicated. And but fortunately, so, this did not result in, a, in an incident, but we came very close to it. Well, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, that, that, that looks serious that part of the topic here is like maybe visibility and how do you actually can know about those things because very hard I guess to track all the vi wiring and uh, I guess it's something that you can do once in a while, but uh, maybe it's not good enough for this perspective. Uh, so very interesting. Um, so the next one will be, uh, the next question will be uh, to, um, to, uh, uh, to Chan and Christian, uh, a bit about our standards and uh, which ones do you follow when it comes to railway cybersecurity? So Chan, you've already talked a little bit about it, but would you like maybe to elaborate about how do you address it? Hello, could you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Um, earlier I mentioned about the IEC 62443. Uh, just a second. Just a second. No. Right, I'm back. Right, it's not hacking, no worry. And uh, this is the IEC 62443. In fact, it is a very thick document. And we should not just say uh, we apply all this control and, and standard to all the system. That's why we have now the, uh, and try to uh, distinguish the, uh, a different system and apply to a different level. Uh, I may not be able to elaborate too much on here, but uh, I think I could just say that, uh, in fact, in the IEC 62443, they are defining a different security level, level two, level three, or level one. Okay, mm -hmm. and our uh, practice now is that for those safety and surface critical system, we try to aim for a security level three, while the others is security level two. So that would be our initial thought. I think we, it takes some time for us to actually follow it and to understand more how this is going to affect the design and the operation of it. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Christian, like to add your take on that? Yes, so uh, we easily uh, use uh, three standards. Currently, we have uh, ISO 27001 for the uh, general ISMS. So for the management system, this is used. So the management system is the same for uh, OT and IT, which we currently use. For OT specifically, we are currently using IEC 62443, as it was also uh, already mentioned. Uh, but we will uh, switch over to the new Stanleck technical specification 5071 for cybersecurity for railway systems as soon as it gets published beginning of next year. Currently, we are already um, checking if all the concepts and um, requirements of the draft can be fulfilled by what we are doing. Uh, it looks quite good. Um, and as soon as it's officially published, we'll use it instead okay. of 62443 or let's say it in addition i'm sure all of us here are looking forward to see what's going to be like the outcome of it and uh, it looks like a great step toward uh, toward generalizing the topic um great um so we have a few more questions before uh, we move to the audience and uh, we have some questions already like also from the audience coming by the way please feel free to add additional questions we're going to have uh, approximately 10 minutes for that. Um, so just feel free to add your additional questions. Um, so now we're gonna maybe deep dive a little bit on each of your like uh, domains uh, and uh, we'll, uh, uh, we, we, we'll start with Chan here. Um, um, Chan, can you please maybe like Talk a little bit about the cybersecurity of CBTC systems in particular, and how like <laughs> CBTC systems are uh, what, what the consideration need to take into account in CBTC mm. system. Like how how do you view them? Right, well, I I think why people are more interested about the CBTC is because of the the word communication based train control. Because you have this communication that everybody will say that okay, communication would be linked to cybersecurity. 
And another uh, reason why it is so interested about that is because many of these CPTC systems are actually running on the a so-called Wi-Fi network. And people will say, oh, Wi-Fi network would be very vulnerable because from uh, time to time we hear about uh, uh, there are hackers hacking the Wi-Fi or entering into a network through the Wi-Fi connections. But uh, I think we need to uh, actually look into that, that a CPTC system is not purely relying on the security of the Wi-Fi network. In fact, um, there is another level or even two level of security on top of the Wi-Fi network. Uh, this is all the, sometimes called the encryption or even sometimes is talking about the protocol between, exchange between the, the train and the track side system. So um, with this implemented, then we are comfortable that uh, this CPTC could run on one of the Wi-Fi system uh, without any major concern. But to make sure that we are really comfortable with that, very often we will engage some ethical hacking or sometimes you call it a penetration test, asking someone else to be one of the possible hackers and try to hack our systems and to see if there is any loophole of vulnerabilities in the systems. Uh, we are now uh, getting used to it because we will usually will start to have this kind of assessment uh, maybe twice uh, 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 once every two years for our signaling system. And um, we assess uh, actually three dimensions. The first dimension is is the, the design and the organization structure, how the system are being uh, assessed, whether there's password control, whether you have, we'll have all these uh, procedures to govern the use of the systems. The second step is the, is talking about the, we call it the compromise assessment. That means that I'm not too sure whether I'm clean, but actually you could actually do something check to see if I'm clean today. So if there's already any hidden issues there, uh, we hope that this independent body is going to find out. And the third one is the penetration test. Is that I suppose that I'm clean, but I'm not too sure whether I'm strong enough to, to fight against the virus. So this penetration test is going to help us to do so. So we take three steps. The first step is to make sure that we have the proper system in place. And the second step is to make sure that we are clean inside. And the first step is to make sure that we are strong enough to combat any attack from outside. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, thank you. Um... Another question I will ask is uh, more for you, Bish. Maybe you can elaborate more uh, about um, about the digital program of uh, Network Rail and how do you address the cybersecurity issues around ERTMS systems? Yes. Um, so I work in, in an organization called Digital Railway Program, which was actually set up to uh, address these particular issues which would have not got addressed in a conventional signaling and control system world. Just so that we are looking specifically at the issues like cyber security. Now with ERTMS, we are actually um, quite lucky that the subsets actually go into great detail about what the system is supposed to do. Now I use the word system because in a ERTMS, Trackside is a system by itself, and Trainball is a system by itself. But the moment I compare it to railway, they become subsystems because now I'm treating a railway as a system. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge is like the security integrity and the risk analysis, it would be done at a lower level. So, if I were to take ERTMS, so I'm very confident that uh, EVC has been assessed for its own um, security and, you know, like uh, how people can actually uh, penetrate it and, uh, you know, like those stuff. So the manufacturer would have done that test, but the moment it comes into a system, the, the integration element um, is not the responsibility of the supplier and, and we acknowledge that. So like my department and, and Network Rail uh, is uh, put out the policies and, and procedures in place to address this particular integration issues. 
So what we do is basically, like in any ERTMS deployment, first and foremost is we've got to agree on architecture because not all ERTMS deployments are the same. And once the architecture is agreed, we carry out a risk assessment. That would actually then show us as to where there are deficiencies, if any. And then we try and actually address that. So, so that's the process, how we actually deal with uh, the ERTMS. So as a part of our delivery, what we have done is we have taken a generic architecture. We have subjected it to the risk analysis. We have checked out the vulnerabilities and we have come out with mitigation. So anybody who is deploying ETCS uh, projects can look at what we have done and try and see how it matches to their deployment and, and fill in the holes as required. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Um, yeah, it looks like it's a very common process that like you should first like analyze your risks and then focus on how to mitigate them. Uh, we see like here two different technologies, one for more urban systems, one for more mainland systems. Um, it's interesting maybe to see also the common things between the technologies, maybe the use or the integration of safety and how is it works working with security. Mm -hmm. Also an interesting to consider uh, when dealing with uh, those systems and whether like they have the security measures built in within those standards, like whether the SAPSA 26, uh, 37 or the IEEE 1474, which is like the high level requirement uh, for CBDC. Uh, so next we'll move to questions from our audience. We have quite a lot of them. I hope that we can cover uh, that we can cover most and answer them at least briefly. Um, so the first one is coming from uh, Vinay Singh. Uh, he is asking, how do you see patch management, uh, either OS, antivirus, app solution, and signal link systems? How do adapt to automatic update system? And uh, maybe Christian, you can talk a little bit about that because you already discussed a bit the patch management aspect. So uh, uh, if you can uh, answer the, the nice question, it can be great. <laughs> yeah, so um, this stuff is uh, strongly depending uh, on the design of your system, I think. Um, currently, one of the main issues we have regarding patch management is that you have uh, safety admissions for uh, specific systems and which normally goes with checksums over software and so on. And as soon as you change a part of the software, the checksum is changed and with this your admission is gone and you have to uh, apply for another one from your safety authority or whomever. Um, this is a thing that can be tackled and is already being tackled uh, by some vendors, which means that they are sort of splitting up things regarding uh, you have one block of security, one block of safety, and then uh, you are free to uh, update the security block, for instance, as, soon, as long as you um, ensure that the interfaces between the, uh, those two blocks are uh, maintained. Uh, this is also one of the concepts that is uh, shown in this upcoming technical specification. Um, and this is also one thing we are already doing at uh, Deutsche Bahn. What we um, are doing, for instance, with the new interlocking systems is that we have a safety-related um, object controller and for, in front of this, some security component uh, is placed. So all communication goes over this security component and you can update the security component. But in the end, it's a matter of uh, design. So you have to find a way how you can split the safety part from the rest of the system. Some vendors mm -hmm. are better, others have a completely yeah, box solution. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next question is uh, by uh, Claudia Schorsch. Uh, she's asking uh, what specific training do you offer for training signaling experts in cybersecurity? Uh, would someone like to answer in that? Uh, maybe someone coming from the signaling world. Uh, can I can I have a yeah. go? Yeah, go uh, ahead. The answer to that is very little uh, because we the diversity and the, the the training is actually not structured. So. So there are people who come out with cyber credentials, uh, whatever that may be, 
but more often than not, within from the control system, the people have actually taken years to actually get that kind of expertise. So what we can do is we can have refresher modules as such, so we can actually make them interact and connect with the security experts, but turning them into security experts is something which I've not heard, to be, to be fair. And I don't think it would be a good approach because what we are then trying to do is we are trying to put together two exclusive competencies into one. Mm -hmm. Like in, in my mind, they, they are better off by being mutually exclusive, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, the, the definitely the topic here. But uh, yeah, I, I can also maybe share some of the insights uh, following the webinar of how do we, like how, how, what, what trends we recommend on IT security here. Um, so next question is actually from Caracas, Venezuela. Um, so it's by uh, Luis and Miguel Mendoza. And he's asking about uh, the movement of cloud computing and the integration of IoT and so on uh, mm -hmm. and the satellite uh, command systems. Um, and he's asking, how do you like view it like from the perspective of uh, uh, the security, whether it's okay to move to the cloud or uh, or, 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 or is like the train control systems must stay in separate systems because that's the trend in other industries, the transition to cloud. Uh, would someone like to answer that? Maybe Chan? Yes, uh, let me try. In fact, talking about cloud security, I think we could de divide that into two parts. First of all, with whether the cloud itself is secure. And the second part is whether the connection to the cloud is secure. Uh, as for the connection to the cloud, I think we could actually have some very good, well-defined security requirement for the connection to the cloud. Say, for example, it is not a public uh, uh, web-based internet that everybody is going to access. Rather, it could be a lease line or a so-called, we call it the VPN, the virtual private network, so that you have a, a pretty uh, contained connection to the cloud. And the second part is that whether the cloud is secure itself, then perhaps you, we need to ask whether the cloud offer a security service to you in, uh, on top of the processing and the storage. In fact, mm -hmm. today, there are cloud services that actually offer firewall services to us so that we are pretty sure that uh, those uh, information sent to them, they have to go through certain degree of security before they are being processed. And the, the, the thing that they are actually delivering to us is also secure and safe. Mm -hmm. But I, I echo that uh, the, the adoption of the cloud for a so-called control and signaling system is still very new. So we still need to wait and see more examples, right? Interesting. Thank you, thanks a lot. Um, Next question is by Eddie TC and is asking about uh, the challenge or how do you address the challenge of the installed base uh, systems? We talked a lot about uh, uh, the future systems, but how do you actually like protect whatever you already have? And I guess that there comes the challenge of like upgrading and so on. So how do you view that from your perspective? How do you, uh, how do you work with those threats and how do you protect against them? Uh, someone. Who, who, who wants to answer that? All right, I'll have a go. Uh, this is a clear and present danger because what you don't see, you don't remember. Now, more often than not, like, you know, the, the legacy systems are vulnerable and, and that's what I said earlier on. So until and unless uh, the the railway undertaking actually takes an active interest in trying to address the security issues, um, it will not happen. But most of the railways these days, uh, because they're in the process of uh, upgrading the railways anyway, so they actually sweep it under that particular project. So they may not change the base underlying systems. But say, for example, for putting a firewall, it might be a very simplistic solution. Uh, to try and avoid. So it may not take away the risk completely, but at least it is mitigated to as low as reasonably practical. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's that's a challenge that we see a lot. That it's easier like to come in new tenders and uh, ask for security, but the risks are already there. The risks are already there. And mitigating them is super important because those systems will stay there for years. Even the ones we are procured now will stay there for 30 years or so. Uh, another question by George Burfield is asking about uh, uh, procuring. I think it's going to be the last one as well. Procuring and funding investment in real assets. So, do you think like those procurement uh, people or like the investment in real assets do they understand enough in the cyber risks and the assurance needs of the companies? How do you see it from your perspective? Um, maybe Christian, uh, would you like to answer that? Um, this is a good question. Uh, regarding funding currently um at least i can tell for my company uh, so we don't have that much issues currently as um, cyber security is one of the top priorities of our management and we also have to report uh, on a regular basis to them how the status is and so on um what i know about from some other companies is that regarding procurement you sometimes have issues when it comes to um, security versus uh, price of the solution so sometimes people tend to say okay um, the solution is cheaper so let's buy it but nobody cares about security fortunately mm -hmm. we don't have this issue at the moment okay great uh, thank you very much i'm sure it's helpful to join here um, and I think that our time has run out, uh, but uh, personally I found it a very interesting discussion and I want to thank you all, uh, uh, Christian, Vish and Chan, your perspectives were amazing here and uh, the audience is already thanking here for uh, many of the things uh, that you've mentioned. Uh, if anyone have further questions, please feel free to address them either through me or directly to the speakers. Uh, uh, and I'm sure they'll be happy to answer you. Uh, this topic is very important and sharing the knowledge between the continents is a unique opportunity that we have now when we can run this uh, webinar on those uh, digital platforms and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have more, more of those events. Uh, we at Silos promise to organize more of those events to make sure that knowledge is being shared uh, across different companies and uh, uh, and to raise up uh, the knowledge of the people and the level of the awareness and so on. Uh, and again, I want to thank you all the speakers, thank you all the audience for attending, and we look forward to hosting you in our next event. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.